All right, everybody. Welcome. Uh, this is my first keynote ever. It's tight. Yeah. This is our off-topic talk, so uh, whatever. So it's called Keeping It Real. I hope you get the joke. Um, it's not funny if I have to explain it. Uh, so, oh, well. Um, so I'm speaking about what it's like teaching computer programming in the inner city. Um, if I had my own TV show, it would be on Fox, and my character would be played by Steve Harvey. Um, anyways, just a little bit about me. Um, I didn't always live the glamorous life in an, uh, teaching in an inner city math, uh, teaching inner city math and computer science. Uh, my first career choice was actually much worse than that. Um, I was a music major, and I played tuba. I played a pretty hot tuba, actually. Um, so I pivoted to math, and uh, for some reason I just really got into it. Uh, so what do you do with a double major in math and music? Well, you build that lucrative teaching career. So along the way, I fell into computers, and that's what this is kind of about. So stick with me. So I wanted to start with a little bit of a thought experiment. Uh, so I teach at a STEM school, and um, if you're unaware, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. So I wanted to ask the audience, if you could go back in time, let's say start your high school career over, if you could, why would you want to go to a STEM school? Anybody? Does that sound interesting? Yeah. I can't hear you. To get all the money. To get all the money? Yeah. Well, I think most people would answer me because you're interested in those fields. For most of us here, I think it's the technology section, but if you're interested in science or engineering or mathematics, um, that would be something too, that you would want to go to that school that specializes in those things for, right? So I work for one of 39 high schools in the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. Our school is called MC Square STEM High School. And at my school, we did just this. On the first day of school, ninth grade, the principal had students fill out a Google form anonymously and ask them why they decided to attend our school, MC Square STEM. I was shocked because many of the responses said, not because they're interested in all these other things, but they said, because it's safe. Let's frame that student response. So what is teaching in the Cleveland Metropolitan School District like? Well, in a, world, in a word, it's difficult. We're one of 14 school districts in the state of Ohio to be deemed failing last year. For perspective, there are 611 school districts total in Ohio. This year, we had a 75% graduation rate, which is up from just 52% eight years ago, at the time one of the worst graduation rates in the country. Many students come to school just for the hot meal and some socialization, but not really for academics. At some community schools like John F. Kennedy High School, where I used to work, violence is a real thing. The streets can be dangerous. While I was working there during stake testing week, a student was skipping his test and he was across the street at the Burger King. He got shot and killed there. Some gangbangers kind of mistook him from somebody else and gunned him down in a drive-by shooting. This was almost directly across the street from the school building too. At our schools, all bags need to be searched and, students, and students need to go through metal detectors. I've had students who attended school just for the sole purpose of selling drugs. Somehow they got past the security and the drug sniffing dogs. I don't know how. One of my students came in one day nonchalantly telling me that over the weekends there was a drive-by shooting on her street. I asked, weren't you scared? Her response was, they weren't shooting at me. Many students in our district also have more responsibilities than they deserve. Joey, which is not his real name, came to confide in me one day. He walked up to my desk, he sat down, 
He said, Mr. Wolf, I've got problems. He's, struggle- he's 17 years old. He said he's struggling to support his daughter. His sister's in foster care and he's trying to get her back. He works at a fast food job that pays maybe $8 an hour and he pays for half the rent. He works until 1 a.m., which is illegal for minors to be t- uh, working that late. And because of, his late, because of the late work day, he doesn't get home until 2 a.m. He tells me he's depressed, so he doesn't get to sleep until 4 a.m. Then he wakes up at 7 a.m. and gets to school, sometimes. Lisa, also not her real name, one of my former JFK students, had a child in the middle of the school year. Her father had just passed away, and he was the glue that kept kept the family together. She moved to Cleveland from the West Coast for better family support, um, and she lived with just her kind of crazy stepmom. But the family rejected her and her stepmom, um, so it was just the two of them all on their own. She was my second student that year to have a child, And that year, I would estimate that about a third of my female students had children of their own. There's little parental involvement in conferences and other school activities, which could be because of neglect, but it could also be because parents are working several jobs. Now, I need to mention that this isn't just a Cleveland problem, and it's not just an American problem. These problems are throughout the world and also in some Israeli communities. In the past spring, I was, this past spring, I was invited to take part in Cleveland Jewish Federation's collaboration with an Israeli delegation on STEM education. We held sessions to brainstorm ways to increase STEM education in low-performing Israeli schools as a springboard towards driving these young students towards STEM careers and pull themselves out of poverty. This is gonna be the only slide that I read directly But to sum up our experience of our students in poverty, I would like to read you this poem. It is a poem written by a Baltimore public school student that went viral last year. And this picture currently decorates our hallways. I woke myself up because we ain't got an alarm clock, dug in the dirty clothes basket because ain't nobody washed my uniform, brushed my my hair and teeth in the dark because the lights ain't on, even got my baby sister ready because my mama wasn't home. Got us both to school on time to eat us a good breakfast. Then, when I got to class, the teacher fussed because I ain't got no pencil. Currently, I work at MC Square STEM High School, which has a lot of the same problems, but students tend to want more for themselves. Remember how I stated that students chose MC Square STEM because it's a safe place? One of the reasons for that is because MC Square STEM is a school of choice not a community school like JFK where I used to work. Just to be clear though, this is not a charter school. So what do we do differently at MC Square STEM High School? Our, our Our students happen to perform about the same on state testing as their community school peers, something that we as teachers are trying to change, but they have a totally different high school experience. This is my advisory group from two years ago. Notice the troll face poster. Some of the notable differences between our school and a typical CMSD school are that we are year round. So we don't get a huge gap in the middle of the summer. Instead, students get shorter quarterly breaks. This helps academically, but it also helps keep kids off the streets. We focus on project-based learning. Students make capstone projects every quarter that incorporate all the learning that they've, that they've done in, cl- in every class, at least in ninth and 10th grade. In 11th and 12th grade, we focus more on college pr- preparedness. Our schools are split into three different campuses. Ninth grade meets at the Great Lakes Science Center. 10th grade is on the corporate campus of uh, General Electric, GE, Neela Park. And 11th and 12th grade, where I am, is on the campus of the Cleveland State University. 
as students progress through high school, they move through the different campuses. This can create some pros and cons. One con is that depending on where students live, their commute can be over an hour, one direction. The pro, though, is that that physically removes those students away from a lot of the violence that they can experience at some of the other schools. So, how success successful was I at teaching mathematics, both at JFK and at MC Square? Well, students, I found students were about four years behind in mathematics. For all the things that you might do as mental math, I found my students required a calculator. What's nine times three? 27. Sometimes they lean on the calculator so much that they don't even understand the what the mathematical operations mean. Another difficulty is that many students seem to forget the skills I've taught them from one day to the next. But how can you blame them when after school they're going to work for five hours? Their priorities are different. And that's a huge responsibility that I never had at that age. Now you might say, well, make the learning fun and make it relevant. Well, my answer is twofold. First, any topic that fits with the math I'm, I'm I was teaching was too advanced. I could only scratch the surface of the applications. And I'm also trying to catch them up to be prepared for college. Second, I had to teach to the test, to state testing. And there are so many topics that I couldn't focus on one topic too long because then we wouldn't cover all the other things that they needed to learn for that test. So math remained extremely esoteric and abstract for the students, but we did have a good time. Now you might ask, what about all those movies like Stand and Deliver and Dangerous Minds and the rest? They were based on true stories, right? To this, I respond with the Israeli phrase, Ta'chai b'seret. These movies are not so realistic, and moreover, they're patronizing because they largely play into the white savior trope. Some teachers, someplace, may, may have been able to figure out something with a certain set of students at a sp specific point in time, but it's really not like that in the real world. The book for white folks who teach in the hood addresses this. Now, I never actually read the book, but I get a basic idea from my colleagues and more importantly, from Amazon reviews. But uh, anyway, the book basically says that you shouldn't treat your urban students any differently than you would teach any other students. You're not gonna hold them up on a pedestal and you're not gonna teach down to them. You're gonna meet them where they are and do what, they can, what you can for where they are. And that's what I do. So I ended up teaching directly to the Ohio graduation test. Now, the OGT, the Ohio graduation test, is the old test that was deemed unfit for state testing just recently. We've moved to a different test now, which is much more difficult. This OGT is considered to be an, at about a seventh or eighth grade level, and I'm teaching 11th grade. All the while, what I want my students to be is critical thinkers. I want them to think hard and try hard. I don't care about the test at all. I just want them to try hard. So I always got that famous question, when are we ever going to use this in real life? On my good days, I would say, always but never. Always because you're always, you should always be practicing critical thinking skills. Never because you may never actually use this specific skill set ever again. On my bad days, I would answer, I just want you to pass the test. I don't like this type of teaching, personally. Here's the thing I learned, though. Computer programming is way better at teaching critical thinking skills. And more importantly, there's no mandatory state testing for it. I was able to create my curriculum from scratch. So even though my computer use was limited to screwing around with Linux and writing my lesson plans in LaTeX, and yes, this is one of my, uh, my lesson plans. And yes, I am a total math nerd. Uh, it was clear to me that programming would be better at building critical thinking skills, providing immediate feedback, and contextualizing math. 
I only had one problem. I didn't know how to teach computers. I didn't, well, make that two problems. I didn't have any computers except for maybe this one. Well, three problems. We didn't have any funding, so there was no budget for new technology. And if you want to add a fourth, um, I didn't know how to program at the time. And before you ask, yes, this is a school typewriter, no, we didn't actually use it. We had a few laptops. So in a nutshell, how did I learn how to program? Well, lots of online courses. Um, I learned how to use Scratch um, so that I could teach this to my students. It, it's a little bit more complicated than it seems. Um, but I was learning Python online and all that stuff, but since I was doing it online, I didn't even understand what the difference between the shell and the editor was. Um, but this is my favorite book for learning how to code. It's Python for Kids, No Starch Press. I'm not being paid to say that, um, but this is what really springboarded me into things. And you can tell your friends and family that I endorse this product. Meanwhile, I saw that just coding wasn't going to do it for these kids. For most of them, the most sophisticated computer that they had at home or at school was their phone. And yes, I did ask students to do research on their phone at times. Tangentially, a New York Times article concludes that the digital gap between rich and poor is that the poor actually have more screen time than their rich peers. Rich parents tend to put screen time limits on their uh, children where the poor typically don't. Anyways, I found the junk closet full of old and unused computers. We started ripping PCs apart and identifying what different parts did. I'm not going to go over details here because um, I want you to come to my next talk in DevOps days where I'm going to talk about more of that. You'll hear that then. So what did I learn about what they could learn? Well, we're used to computers being something that we only interact with with a keyboard and mouse. But computers can be hands-on. In fact, hands-on computing can be the best way to learn how to do computing. We use the Raspberry Pis uh, for, this, for this idea. One of the Raspberry Pi Foundation's biggest concepts is physical computing. This means using the GPIO pins and coding to make something happen in the real world. I was making challenge problems for students to tackle above and beyond what the, what the curriculum was asking. So we got Kyrie. 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 No. Right. And we got... Antonio. V. Yeah. And what are you about to show me? I'm going to show you that I cycled from red, yellow, and blue on here by using the battery pipe. Okay. Run the code. Whoa! Can you make it go forever? Uh, all I have to do is put a while loop in it. That's right. You have to put it at the beginning. Great job. Thumbs up. All right. And they did all that without me asking. So when it does come to keyboard and editor stuff, HTML is a great tool for learning. Uh, you pull up the editor, and you pull up your browser, and you start editing, and you can find your mistakes almost, almost instantaneously. Don't forget, we're not making anything really complicated here. It's just basic web page building. I gave students creative freedom to work on whatever they wanted to, so they were more invested in the projects. And some web pages were very creative, if not offensive, like the student who wrote a web page about my stinky feet. Yes, this is a real project. Python, the, my favorite critical thinking tool. Since it's very logical and it has easy syntax, uh, it makes it very simple to learn programming. I could even incorporate mathematical concepts, obviously using variables and algebraic concepts, but also geometric concepts. Students use the turtle module to draw things, and they would program the geometric concepts into it with angles and lengths, side lengths, and all that sort of stuff. 
I coached the US first robotics team. This competition brought all these things together, teamwork, coding, physical computing, not to brag, but we were one of the championship teams. We were a force to be reckoned with until I started coaching the team and we were in last place. To be fair, we had a whole bunch of GE engineers helping us out and uh, one year and then the next year it was just me and uh, I don't know what I was doing. I was the only coach, whereas most other teams had like 10 coaches. So it was a disaster. Even though it's not technically my class, one of my favorite units of the year was when we learned about drones. A local community college came into my classroom and we learned how to build and program to automate the drones. And most fun of all, we learned how to fly the drones manually. Um, some students at the end of the course went on and they got their drone flying license. It was a lot of fun. Now I'm back in the math classroom, but guess what? I've been teaching math now in terms of programming. My current math students are my last year's computer students. So possibly one of the best moments of my career was just a couple weeks ago. After two days of learning functions, math functions, he raised his hand, he said, Mr. Wolf, I'm not sure I get this. So I wrote the Python equivalent on the board, and he's like, oh, I get it now. So I wrote this up and printed it out. Yes, it's written in LaTeX, because um, I'm a math nerd. And I handed it out to students, and I pulled up the Python shell on the board, and we were typing in functions, and you could just see the light turning on and seeing that these students really understood what it was that a function was, a mathematical function, because we did it in terms of the computer programming. I just need to emphasize, though, that this is not a silver bullet. Programming, as we know, can still be boring, maybe for some of us. I don't want to make it sound like every day was a new adventure, like it was exciting. It can be hard and tedious work. And many kids didn't take to it. They relied on partner work. But at the end of the day, or the quarter, students can see something that they made with their own brains, and that's something that they could be proud of. So what's going on with all my former computer programming students? Honestly, most of them still don't care about the subject. But at least they appreciate it now, and they learned critical thinking skills, and they were introduced to a field that they otherwise wouldn't have been. And it's not that they didn't enjoy themselves. They had a good time. More importantly, it's said that uh, computer programming helps students learn critical thinking skills, and that can lead to increased test scores. I wish I could say that I helped them increase their test scores, but I just don't have enough data to conclude one way or another. By the way, I just got an email from my principal saying that we need to teach directly to the test because of stuff that's going on and our students are too behind and uh, that was very upsetting. Anyways, there are other students who um, really took to the computer programming and the computer science. Um, all of these kids here, I believe, are in computer science fields. The three to my left are on the Cleveland State University campus and I see them often. It's really good to see how they've matured or not matured, depending on the case. Right now I'm currently coaching one of my math students to study for the A plus, the CompTIA A plus, and possibly also the Security Plus exam uh, before he graduates this spring. He told me that he's interested in cybersecurity and that he'll have to join the military in order to get into the field. But his ASVAB scores, the ASVAB is the military standardized test that you take before entering, may not be good enough to do what he wants to do. So that's when I approached him about the A plus and the security plus possibilities, and he was very excited about that. I actually approached him about that the day before I left for Israel. So he's very excited about that. Now, I'm sure you all find this very inspiring, but this is Cloud Native Day, so I want to tie this into the, cl the cloud and DevOps experience. There are more similarities that you might think. For example, 
I was working with a resource-poor environment. I know that you all may have multi-million dollar budgets, but I figured someone in cloud projects may be able to relate. Trying to make math meaningful and educational and relevant year after year, despite unexpected setbacks and failures, is not dissimilar from continuous optimization processes. As a point of perspective, I'm willing to bet that your optimization projects never stalled because your orchestration manager got shot outside of Burger King. Culture is everything. Certainly we know this as folks working on DevOps and cloud projects. I try to foster positive culture and collaboration by any, any means necessary, including but not limited to taking students for paddle boat rides in Lake Erie and just playing good music while students work. Creative problem solving is a skill everyone needs to master, and I'm not talking about using pre-built function libraries. I mean, getting things done that you know will piss everyone off, even though they need to get done. Like when I installed Linux on every single school laptop because the remote directory was taking half of the class period just to log in. Like I told you, I didn't know what I was doing when I started. I still don't know what's coming next. But my family and I will be making Aliyah in a few months, hopefully the coming year. And it, I don't have a job yet. <laughs> it's trite and it's cliche, but the reality is that doing this work showed me that we usually don't know how good we have it. Once you've had these kids experience, a system crash at 2 a.m. really isn't that upsetting, and being asked to refactor code really isn't a burden. Thank you.